one of the things we really talk about in the book. It's like getting really clear on what you have to offer, what you can control, tapping into your power because it is so hard to predict what's going to happen on the outside in a new job in your current job the job you're you know deciding to leave and just really clarifying kind of what's yours and what isn't yours especially in a work world that can be really impersonal when one of the things we talk about in the book is sort of bringing more humanity into the workplace and as Lauren said depersonalizing it because it, it can be uncaring and that's hard work in many ways is very personal we put our heart and soul into it and it's important to be recognized and when that doesn't happen whether in your job or in your search it's really hard. Welcome back to the Career Therapy Podcast, where we explore the hidden side of modern work, help you turn procrastination into job search motivation, and teach you how to stress less, earn more, and change careers with confidence. My name is Martin McGovern, founder and lead coach at Career Therapy, and I'm excited to introduce our guests today. Yes, guests, plural. We have two guests joining us. Please welcome Kathy Wasserman and Lauren Weinstein to the podcast. Kathy and Lauren are the co-authors of the Empowered Job Search book, who draw on more than 30 years as career and leadership coaches with significant influences from positive psychology, Buddhist principles, and nonviolent communications to help you know yourself and take control of your career in this modern world. In today's episode, we talk about the differences between performative and personal identity, the importance of narrative in building career confidence, and how to tap into cleaner forms of motivation in your job search, going beyond fear, beyond anxiety, and beyond failure to actually make moves and find success. If you like our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. It truly helps us get the word out to more people struggling in their search and allows us to keep having candid career conversations like this one. Now grab a cup of coffee or tea and settle in for my conversation with Kathy and Lauren. Well, I'm very excited to chat with you both. I think, you know, the work that you're doing and the book you've put together, which I got right here, the empowered job search, super exciting. Um, I think it's really cool, especially the, you know, as I was going through things, you talk about getting the emotional side of things right before getting into the tactics. And I'm very much a proponent of that because I'm like, you know, you can work on your resume till the cows come home, but if you don't know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you've got all these blockers between you and networking and things like that, the job search is going to be pretty rough. So I'm just kind of curious as we kick things off here, what are the typical um, emotional blockers that you've seen people run up against as they've been going through the job search? What are maybe the most common things that you see? Kathy, do you want to jump in? We decide who would answer. <laughs> we both can. Do you want to ask each of us and then we'll... Sure, Kathy, kick us off. What are the most common uh, emotional blockers that you see uh, in the job search on a regular basis? Yeah. I think one of the most common is feeling totally overwhelmed. Very often when folks are thinking about a job search, it's because something's going wrong in their current job and it can be really hard to know where to start, how to correct what hasn't worked, whether it's an issue with the supervisor or someone feels like they might be in even the wrong job or sector. Um, it really can be a flood of emotions. And so we, we do a lot of work in the book at disentangling the kind of emotional knot that can emerge over time that uh, catalyzes someone to start a search. Yeah, especially since- Yeah, you know, and I would add that it's- oh, Jump on in, Lauren, right. jump on in. Uh, it's, I would add too that it's not just at the beginning of the job search. I think what's striking is just that there's emotions at every stage, right? And so I think we, we offer some ways of dealing with those ups and downs um, at every stage of the process. 
And I think, you know, I'm going to layer on, I think overwhelm is the, it encapsulates all the different emotions and Kathy described the untangling of what those emotions are. Um, but frustration, loneliness, anxiety, um, you know, you can tease each one of those different strands um, into something that feels really personal for you based on what your experience, what your experience is. Yeah, and I, I like the way that you phrase it as an emotional knot, because truthfully, that is what it is, right? And a lot of what we do as coaches is help people, you know, <laughs> work at that thing, because it gets really, really balled up. Um, when it comes to, you know, the job search and, and the mental state that people are in, one of the things that I notice quite often is this idea that, uh, you know, they quite often because of not addressing the mental pieces early or the emotional pieces early will make things harder for themselves in the job search, right? And I'm curious, what are maybe a couple examples that each of you have come across of folks who have, you know, the problems that they're running up against as real as they are in their mind and in the moment probably aren't as big or as scary or as maybe, you know, um, they're not as much of a barrier as they maybe could be if we had the right mindset. Where are we making it harder on ourselves as job seekers? Lauren, I'll let you kick it off. Yeah, and I actually went through two job searches as you were writing this book. So oh, wow. um, I definitely put myself in the shoes of somebody looking for a job and also somebody who is you know, advising around job search and career journeys. Um, and I would say one piece of it for me is around identity, right? Like. It feels like a personal letdown if somebody doesn't respond to you. Um, you know, if you put in such a huge effort around an application and then nothing happens <laughs> and it's really disheartening and you feel like it can be a, like a personal attack in some ways, even though it's really, you know, the narrative that you're creating and maybe there's some ounce of truth around what's happening in the backdrop. Um, but I think that's, that's really what gets in the way as you're starting to, you know, apply for jobs and, and feeling like, oh my gosh, is there something about me that I'm not conveying or communicating properly? And Kathy, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think the personalizing is really tough. We do live in a ghosting culture now. So I think both when folks are in a job and they may feel like they haven't been seen um, for what they have to offer and then also, you know, navigating, looking for interviews. So I think making a general statement in one's mind that because you haven't heard back um, about an interview or because you had a particular supervisor who didn't um, sort of care and nurture you in the way you saw it, that this is the way it will be with everyone. And one of the things we really talk about in the book, it's like getting really clear on what you have to offer, what you can control, tapping into your power, because it is so hard to predict what's going to happen on the outside in a new job, in your current job, the job you're you know, deciding to leave, and just really clarifying kind of what's yours and what isn't yours, especially in a work world that can be really impersonal. When one of the things we talk about in the book is sort of bringing more humanity into the workplace. And as Lauren said, depersonalizing it because it, it can be uncaring and that's hard. Work in many ways is very personal. We put our heart and soul into it and it's important to be recognized. And when that doesn't happen, whether in your job or in your search, it's really hard. Yeah, I yeah. Think that's and, huge. and Kathy, I'll, I'll add, I'll add to one more thing is that what's interesting is I think the power dynamic is shifting right now with, you know, with the trends around people looking for new work, there being a lot of opportunities, the great resignation, the great reshuffling, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of movement right now. And I think in, in an interesting way, it actually calls for um, some of what we advocate for in the, in the book around, um, you know, being virtuous with others and being in the virtuous cycle. And I think it calls for um, the ability for, you know, you to recognize that if you do have some power, how to use it with um, respect and intention and, in, you know, in, in the spirit of um, camaraderie. Yeah, I, I, and I definitely want to dig into the great resignation with you too. Um, and, and before we get into that, I want to dig in even deeper into this idea of not being seen, 
because uh, when it comes to the ghosting piece and when it comes to not being seen and a lot of, you know, the messages out there are like how to brand yourself, how to promote yourself, right? And then people go and do that and maybe they get a couple of likes on a post and then they get frustrated there. And it is it is this kind of, um, it, it's, it's kind of tough for folks uh, to try and be so visible and so seen in a time when they're feeling so unsure and so insecure, right? It's, it's this weird kind of push and pull. You'd think we, we would want to wait till we're fully employed and feeling confident about our careers and our jobs. Then we go talk about our expertise, right? But what a lot of times we're telling people to do as coaches is just like, actually, you're probably ready now, even if you don't feel like it, right? And so I'm kind of curious when, when people are going out there and they're sort of trying to show themselves in the best light while feeling potentially the worst they've ever felt, how do you help them navigate that? Or what kinds of things should they start to think about to balance those two scales? Um, I, I think that it's really important first for people to acknowledge the reality of what they are feeling and that feeling really vulnerable is natural and that also we live in a culture of the sort of brand yourself culture. And in the book, we sort of flip that paradigm to a know yourself and share yourself paradigm. So the notion is not that as you're chatting with people about potential jobs that you necessarily bring your tissue box, although it happens, but that you're honest about you know, what you've been through, what you seek to share, how it's grown you, how it's shaped your world view and how you want to contribute and that you really do your own work and your own process get your support team really put into place because it does take a village to get a job even in the great resignation because it is such a vulnerable part of just being human is to work and also not be working. A lot of people who come to us actually have lost a job even in this time. And to be without a job when so much, particularly of larger American culture is rooted in you are where you work and what you do is extraordinarily challenging. And we mustn't forget too, that we've all been through COVID, which persists. So there's just a, a great deal of vulnerability, I think on the plate for everyone now. And that is exponentially exaggerated for job seekers. Absolutely. Lauren, anything to add there? Yeah, I would add that you know, we offer some different practices in the book, morning and evening practices. And I think that kind of can help with the getting unstuck, right? Or getting frustrated. And I think it takes a lot. It's really hard to get out of your own way. Um, and, you know, kind of by doing a series of things that nurture you, that get you grounded, that get you energized, all those things, as Kathy says, around taking a village and a combination of you really, um, you know, diligently, going after what you, it is that you need to create the conditions so you can be in a more open mindset and one that you have a sense of possibility because that that's contagious and and when you're interviewing with people they can they can sense that if you really if you are coming across as authentic or if you're you know putting on a show and i think i think when you do the deep work um, and you feel supported you're able to connect in a more relatable way yeah, and when it comes to the emotional side of things, it always, you know, brings up the idea of, uh, you know, Pixar's Inside Out, right? Um, because there's the external village, right, of all the people in our network, our family, our friends, anyone who's supporting us in the job search. And that's something that we all need to work on and continue to foster and grow. And I, we, we might come back around to that and talk about like how to actually reach out to people when you're feeling insecure. But there's also the internal village that we have to navigate and, and care for, right? Because I do think that when it comes to this idea of identity, when it comes to these ideas of emotions, one of the traps that people fall into is identifying fully with one thing, right? We, we mentioned here, you know, you are the work and what you do, right? And I think that that idea is kind of what messes people up in the first place sometimes, where I'll see someone get laid off from a job and they don't just lose 
their financial security, they lose their identity, they lose their reputation, right? Their job title was their identity and their company was their reputation and their salary was their security. So it's like you lose so many parts of yourself and then you have to go kind of rebuild your internal sense of self without this, uh, this job to kind of give you uh, a clear sort of literal list on the job description of like who you are, right? And so um, when, when we sit down and we think about like, what actually is your identity beyond your personal brand, beyond your job title, beyond any of these sort of markers that we see, how do each of you define what someone's identity might be and, and how they can think about it in a healthier way? Yeah, we had many conversations about this. Um, I think from my own perspective, I look at identity as ideally rooted in someone's intrinsic worth, which is beyond what they do, say their roles, their hobbies, like that's all great. Um, but there's something just fundamentally kind of miraculous about being alive and getting a shot at this thing we call life. And so really working with people to get underneath all the roles they play, because fundamentally our roles are always changing, whether it's our role and identity around work or getting older or going through a big transition in life beyond career. And so we do a lot of work in the book to help people explore all these aspects of themselves. We call this your unique value, which is bigger than just your professional value. It's really like your kind of human fingerprint all these different parts of you and just slowly kind of chipping away at what these parts of you are and also recognizing the cultural overlay, which is a lot of pressure to be one role. I think one of the gifts of our time is we're living in a great awakening to the fluidity of identity. It's incredible. I never thought I would see this in my lifetime. It's amazing. Um, and so I think though that can be overwhelming when you're job searching, there's a great opportunity in it as well. And I think we hope that the book provides some structure, everything from the morning and evening practices as Lauren described to many other rituals and practices we describe in the book to really connect more deeply to that inner community, that inner universe. I was thinking about um, as I was job searching and how I had this moment where I realized I hadn't told anyone that I'd been interviewing with that I'm a mom. And I realized that I had never had to explain that to anybody before in a search because I hadn't been a parent before in other previous uh, job searches. So it's just this really interesting thing around the fluidity of identity. And I think Kathy, you describe it really well around the different hats we wear uh, we wear and then also kind of our own mental upgrade of like oh yeah this is really important to me and I, I actually haven't communicated that or conveyed that and I had this moment of like okay I actually I, I should tell them <laughs> and it wasn't a bad thing I think actually showing that I was a mother might have shown a different layer of care or attention or a different aspect of my identity um, but again I hadn't made that that upgrade in my mind yet. That's so fascinating because it, it really does change like our identities do change they change by the year by the life circumstance they change by the interaction we're having right there's some conversations where the power dynamic is uh you know where someone is higher in the power dynamic or lower in the power dynamic and i think that um when folks think about their identity in the job search unfortunately their mind usually goes to lack of experience what i'm missing what I don't have. It's, it's always coming from this place of like, I'm going to be found out. And this is where that imposter syndrome piece comes in, right? Like I always make the joke that people aren't scared of being imposters. They're scared of being caught as imposters. And that being caught piece, I think is where people struggle because identity can sometimes be something that's, you know, very personal and very kind of inherent and, and just sort of uh, empowering in many ways, but it can also be very um, performative, right? And I think a lot of times we're pretending or performing, we've got the fake it till you make it phrases, we've got all sorts of different things like that. And I think some people don't even fully understand where their 
true identity starts and stops and where their performed identity starts and stops. And I'm kind of curious, you know, what have you seen in people's sort of performative side that has been either helpful or hurtful? And, and how does the insecurity play into all of this? <laughs> That's an amazing question. I think about that all the time. <laughs> Lauren's looking at me, she knows. I, I think that we're living in a time where the performance of self relationship and identity is all the rage. And I think it's very confusing for people. I, I think maybe our hope is that what we're talking about is less performance and more being and sharing. So really going through a process in the book of getting to know what is authentic authentically you and you know you're not going to share every piece of that all the time with everyone that you're community building networking with or interviewing with but getting more rooted in that and frankly even naming what you just did is something that I do all the time every day in coaching I mean I would say one of the biggest pieces people come to me to work on is imposter syndrome. From CEOs to managers to social entrepreneurs, I literally hear about that. I just heard about it like 20 minutes ago before we got on this call. And so I think that helping people root more what they know about themselves, how they want to grow and move away from this. I get a sell myself, very kind of American capitalist mindset and more like, wait, who am I really? Like, what does it mean in this moment to be me looking for a job and do some integrative work is really key. And frankly, I think almost a survival skill going forward as we get more performative. I don't see it getting less necessarily culturally. I think also in the eyes of hiring managers, I think people tend to feel like they have to perform for the audience, right? Um, because they think that, oh, a certain type of person might get this role, or this is what the ideal candidate looks like. And so they have to bring it in this certain way. And so I think that can also get confusing as we're talking about identity and even, you know, as you're getting clear for yourself of what that looks like. Yeah, I, I, it's so funny to bring it into the interview space, right? Because uh, I, one of the things that I've, I figured out early in my career as I was dealing with different anxiety <laughs> issues and stuff like that was I just started to kind of look at things through an absurdist lens. I was like, this is an absurd conversation. The way that we're situated in this room, the way that we're dressed, the way we are like, I don't normally wear a suit on a daily basis, but for some reason in this conversation, I have to right? And so I started looking at it from that kind of funny perspective. And it kind of helped me separate a little bit from the overwhelm that can pop up in those situations, but also to see the other person as a human as well. And I think that's one of the funny things about interviewing and the job search and this performative identity stuff is that, you know, we go in and we try to be X, Y, and Z thinking that's what they want to hire. And then meanwhile, the person interviewing us is also performing. They're pretending like they know what the hell they're doing. Not that they just Googled a bunch of questions 10 minutes before walking in that room or something like that. Uh, and they're trying to seem like they've got their lives together because they're supposed to be the representative of the company, right? And one of the funny things, just to kind of give an example to this, is like people will always ask at the end of an interview bad questions, right? I'm sure you've heard so many. But uh, one of the things they'll say is, how do you like working here? And I'm like, you really think you're going to get a real answer from the person interviewing you who's representing the company right now about how they feel about the company? No, you got to get them like, I don't know, drunk at a happy hour or after they got fired to tell, tell you the truth about how they feel about things. You're just going to get, I love it. And so this is kind of one of those things where it's hard to know where reality ends and like true authentic connection begins when doing all this stuff. And I think with imposter syndrome, maybe the hardest piece is in that networking piece. And so this kind of brings us from the internal uh, community, the internal village to the external village. Um, but if we're not feeling confident in ourselves, it's going to be really difficult to go talk to people, to go build that external village, right? I think a lot of people 
don't even share with their friends that they're job seeking sometimes, unless they're like really panicky or like, you know, late night trying to get a, a referral or something. So what sort of things would you recommend people do if they're, they know they should network, but they just can't bring themselves to do it? Well, I want to, before we answer that question, Martin, I just want to respond to something you said, because I think Kathy and I both really want to shift the culture around what you named, which is this like performative dance you know, as you're trying to be your authentic self. Like we want both individuals to be able to represent, represent themselves in, in a, an authentic way, in an authentic way, not an inauthentic way. And also for people representing their companies to actually feel like they have safety and understanding to, to accurately showcase what it, what it really means to work at that place. Because otherwise you're kind of signing up for something that is not really accurate. And, you know, and so I think we do ask some questions around, you know, even around decision making modes and how do people make decisions inside their organization and just to kind of pressure test the structure, because I do think we need to be better citizens inside companies and also when we're not working inside a system. Um, I think that will create a better experience on the whole. That's exciting. Kathy, what are your, your question. No, I love it. <laughs> Kathy, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'm so with this. I, I feel like we have such a moment. I hope it's more than a moment, but especially with the great resignation and with some power shift happening that I've been sort of hoping for for about 30 years of understanding like we're, we're all humans. We have a beautiful world, but it's in a lot of trouble and we need to roll up our sleeves and get honest about who we each are, how we can co-create and get to working on this world together. And it's very hard to do that when you're performing. I think that social media has also really fostered this like, oh, I have this brand and I have this way of being. And so I actually think that people need coaching and training specifically on this, starting from young ages, definitely in college when you look for a job. And it's certainly something that people come to me about in coaching. Like, how do I negotiate? I have this whole image on my Instagram, but then there's me. Like, should I have that image or should they be the same or who am I? So I think that, you know, this is what we're hoping these conversations will kind of spark a deeper look at getting just more real and getting down to rather than image the actual work at hand because it's it's huge what's before us right now and also wonderful what we can potentially create in this time. We interrupt today's episode to let you know about Career Therapy's Unstuck Coaching Program. If you're feeling paralyzed by job search procrastination and unsure of what to do next in your career, we're here to help. Each month as a member, you will get access to two one-on-one -on -one coaching calls, unlimited virtual chat with your coach via Slack, invitations to bi-weekly group coaching sessions, and lifetime access to our eight-part job search curriculum. Want to take your search to the next level? Head over to careertherapy.com and schedule a free 15-minute consultation to chat with me today and see if coaching is right for you. Now back to our show. I really like what you're saying here because it's it, it's so funny. As I was coming up in the workforce, it was um, all about learning how to brand yourself. Like when I was in college, that was the whole thing. It's like no one knows how to create a website for themselves. No one knows how to create a brand for themselves. But now we're in a world where the younger generations are like so good at branding, so good at taking photos of themselves, so good at making TikToks and videos and things like that. Then now it's almost the opposite. We have to coach people how to not perform, how to just be themselves, how to like understand who they are beneath this facade that they've created. It really is quite interesting. And it it kind of reminds me of um, in my early days when I was in marketing and teaching uh, personal brand coaching. Um, we always use the example of, uh, of Hulk Hogan versus The Rock. Hulk Hogan, if he takes off, takes off the bandana and the glasses and, and the 90s getup, you don't know who he is. Like you can't even recognize him. And so he travels dressed as his character in order for people to know who he is. Whereas The Rock could be in any clothing and you would understand who he is, which I always find to be such a funny thing. Um, but yeah, it is this sort of deconstruction of 
ourselves. And, and that's one of the things that maybe is the toughest part of the job search is that it it's almost a forced deconstruction. You, you don't have much of a choice. You are almost one of the comforts of being in a job for five to 10 years is that you can stop thinking about who you are and what you're trying to accomplish and all these things. You can just kind of do your job every day and go home. And then you get launched into this reality of like, oh no, who am I? And what am I trying to accomplish next? I don't want to make the same mistakes again or put myself in a bad position. So I've actually got to start doing this work. And unfortunately, this work takes time to do, but the job search is something that people want to get over with as fast as possible. So there's that weird dichotomy of like, getting to know yourself is a lifetime, you know, <laughs> journey, whereas the job search you want to be done on day one. So how do you sort of deal with that push and pull between speed and, you know, self, I guess, patience and, and growth in this process? It's much easier to dispense this advice than to take it. Mm -hmm. I would just say that for a lot of people, which is, you know, we, we do see the, the job search as an amazing, you know, learning experience and an opportunity to have this transformational experience. And I think that, you know, we look at that as just one part of the, your, your leadership journey. And so what you're doing on the job, actually, you should be doing off the job too. So when you're job searching, you're really setting yourself up for some of the behaviors and patterns and ways of being inside the workplace. So that's, um, that's just a little bit of a, how I'm feeling about about that. But Kathy, I don't know if you want to share more. Definitely. No, just piggybacking off what you're saying, we really make the point in the book that the activities that we recommend for job search are the same things you actually need to be doing in a job, maybe at a bit of a slower pace. And we try to make them kind of interesting and maybe, dare I say, fun at times, like this notion of, you know, even in a job search, it's not, as you said, like you're going to get to know every part of yourself, but you're going to chip away and get to know a little more. And rather than seeing it like, oh, I got to do this when I'm job searching, but then I can coast when I'm in a job. We really take the stance that, you know, life and work is about discovery. And so if you can bite size these tasks and these processes, then it can become easier and you sort of don't get that alarm bell <laughs> going off when you know you need a new job. It's like, okay, I've been doing a few things in the last few years to get to know myself. I might kind of pump up the volume a little bit on that, but it's not like, you know, I've been living in Russia and now I'm going to China. It's like, it's more of a similar country. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And it really does sort of it. it and, and I like that you're doubling down on it, because there is this sort of idea that once I get the job, this is over. I just, I can't wait to get the job so I can stop doing this work. And that's, that's definitely not the right way to look at things, especially if you want promotions. <laughs> like, you got to continue to apply all of this stuff to your day to day work. And as we're applying it to our work, that's also just like analyzing, what do I like about my job today? What do I dislike about my job today? What do I want to be doing more of? And then going and seeking that out within your company and things like that. Um, and I think this is maybe one of the reasons why the great resignation is sort of taking place, right? I think a lot of people bought into this tech idea of like, my career is my life, right? Um, I'm going to go work at Google. They give me lunch and dinner while I'm there. I never leave the office. I'm always on campus kind of a thing to this sort of wake up call that there really are no secure jobs. There really are no, you know, uh, for like certainties in, in general. And um, I know we've been talking about the great resignation a lot. It's being talked about in the media a lot, but for anyone who might not know what the great resignation is, can one of you give maybe a quick synopsis of it and, and how do you think it's, or what do you think it tells us about employee empowerment right now? Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, coaching on kind of a daily basis, um, I think that it's about people having 
light bulbs. <laughs> Many light bulbs go off during COVID around like, oh my goodness, there's more to life. There's like life and death issues. And I can't keep putting off till tomorrow, next week, next year, my rethink on what I might do and my sort of own marriage or commitment to doing work that's meaningful for me. And so I've seen it with my own clients, like just more, I mean, I've been doing this for many years. I've never seen so many people want to do deep, deep rethinks and be willing to even say like, look, I'm going to risk the salary. You know, like I'm going to, I'm going to risk the financial piece because this is that important. And so I think, you know, I have, I also coach employers and so they're kind of coming to you like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we don't even have enough time to make a decision to offer someone a job. They've already gotten two offers. And I think from my perspective, you know, and, and Lauren, perhaps, you know, this is ultimately probably a good thing. Thing because the power differential has really been so skewed in the workplace in a way that just isn't real. I mean, ultimately, both parties, employer, staff have to be satisfied in order to work together. But the whole way the recruitment process is set up, annual reviews, like the whole thing is just super skewed. Um, and so I'm an idealist a little bit. I'm hoping that this injects more truth into the reality of what this relational dynamic is, which is really equal, because I do see all people as equal, doesn't matter what your position is, and that it's about really job seekers taking the time to know themselves better and then reapply, reinject themselves into the workforce in a more specific way that aligns with their unique value and employers taking this as a like note to self, like how do we create a more um, vibrant, fair, dynamic workplace that retains you know, these human beings who we're working with all day long and all week and sometimes all weekend. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, I, I agree with everything you said, Kathy. I think people are just tired. They're tired of maybe trying on or working in a job that just doesn't really do it for them, or they're tired of the dynamics with a work colleague or a manager. And and now with, I think, some in some parts of the world, the economy opening up and they're, and they're feeling like there's more jobs available. Um, I think the power dynamic is shifting a bit more towards candidates or job seekers who are looking for opportunities and with COVID, it's just like, it's been almost two years. It will be two years in March, 2022. And I think it's just like, as Kathy said, the it's so profound uh, to be even be alive and to have the choice of how you work and where you spend your time and who you spend your time with. Yeah. So I think it's really palpable right now for a lot of people. You even just saying it's been two years, just... Uh... I haven't thought about it in those terms in a while. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh, you're right. It's been two years and it really has changed how people view the world and view themselves and interact. And I think, I think in ways that we don't even fully, you know, haven't fully comprehended yet, how that has changed our feelings of identity, our feelings of connectedness, our feelings of work and things like that. And I'm, you know, I think it's so interesting, um, you know, <laughs> with this, there's going to be a lot more flexibility with hybrid work in the future. And there's going to be hopefully more flexibility in changing careers in the future. And, and I'm, I like that you called out the employer perspective here, because I think sometimes it can get very us against them with the job seekers and the employers. And I think um, it's important to have like empathy for employers as well, because although the hiring practices are eh, probably far too complex than they need to be. You know, I'm working with someone right now and they've had six interviews just to get like an entry level sales role at a gym. And it's like, that should be one conversation, maybe. <laughs> like that, the, this is kind of insane how companies are just, and, and there's plenty of reasons why, right? There's death by committee, there's, um, a lot of risk. And I think a lot, what people don't understand 
what job seekers maybe don't fully understand about companies is that the job seekers coming from a place of stress, maybe a layoff, maybe, you know, been job searching a while, but companies are also coming from this place of fear and anxiety and lacking and stress as well, because they're trying to fill a role to accomplish a goal or to fix a problem that's happening. They're not coming from this, like, we just have money. Let's give it to people. Like that's not ever <laughs> what I've heard a company say. It's always like we need someone yesterday. Depending we... on the, the depending on the startup and technology fair, sector you're in, but fair. yes, but yes. <laughs> and and so I'm kind of curious, you know, with this whole great resignation thing. Um, have you seen anything going on on the employer side that you think is going to be lasting? Because I do feel that with the people that I'm talking with who are in the job search, I think there's a certain echelon of, of workers who, yeah, right now, if you want to be a senior marketer somewhere and you want to move from a senior marketing role to another senior marketing role, it's a snap. Um, but there's also a lot of entry level folks or you know, the coding industry for entry level folks is is still, I don't know, it depends on who you are. It's kind of difficult to break into. And I almost look at it from the perspective of social skills. Those with great social skills are getting eaten up in jobs. Like they're just getting picked and picked and picked and they can get promotions and, and jump roles. But people who are really introverted or nervous or uh, having a difficult time building that external village of, of support are still struggling quite a bit. And then they hear all this great resignation stuff about the empowerment of the job seeker and maybe get a little frustrated by it. Um, what sort of things are you seeing in the different types of people that the, you know, the great resignation is maybe favoring certain industries or not favoring others? And what might someone do to kind of improve their positioning in this, in this great resignation world? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think from my perspective, the most fundamental thing is really going back to yourself and what you know about yourself. I mean, especially for introverts, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's such a world and a work world that favors extroversion. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it used to be pretty balanced. But now it's just like great favoring across many industries. And so I think that's been hard for people who are more introverted, which is probably about half the population. Um, and so I think, you know, whether you're introverted or extroverted, whatever sector you're from, I do think knowing what your unique value is, not pushing for the sell yourself. Oh, it's the great resignation. Now I really have to sell myself. <laughs> But more like, okay, this is a pause for at least some industries. And I don't know that I'm seeing clear trends. I mean, I definitely think there's certain positions such as the one you mentioned, but I'm seeing it fairly random. Generally, higher level positions are benefiting more from the great resignation and, you know, more entry level less because of the power dynamics. It's sort of the same dynamic that's always operative, but I think like not seeing this like, okay, now I really have to get my tap dance routine perfect, but more like, oh, what a great time to start my morning ritual, as Lauren mentioned, you know, and how can I really think about given the needs that are so pressing now across industry and position, how I am uniquely positioned to serve and contribute. So how can I, in a way, be a journalist of myself rather than a salesperson in this sort of free for all market? Yeah, and I think um, with employers, I think there's some goodness that has happened in the last two years with COVID, right? You talked about remote work and virtual work and just the shifting dynamic of people and where, where they're able to work, right? I think that's benefited a lot more for, been a bigger benefit for knowledge workers. And I think that you know, there's been a, a bigger investment in mental health and well being inside organizations on the whole that I'm seeing from a, even a benefits brokerage perspective. Um, and also, you know, investment in diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives. And I think that, you know, there's, there's been some good movement from an employer perspective around, you know, what, what employee experience should look like inside an organization. 
Um, and certainly that just depends on the resources that you have. If you're an you know, under-resourced nonprofit, you might be feeling the strain right now more acutely because maybe the funding has shifted in a different direction given the nature of all the you know, social, economic, political dynamics that have happened in just the last um, two years. So I think it's, it's you know, first, I, I agree with Kathy that it's, I think it has um, impacted and been more positive for folks who are in some more you know, mid senior level roles um, because there's, I feel like there's a, more of a, a demand for certain skill sets. And I, I think like the, the, the overarching skill set of being able to um, be emotionally savvy or emotionally aware, some people might call emotional intelligence, um, definitely serves everybody. Um, and also like we have to acknowledge that the manufacturing industry and, and supply chain has, has been disrupted in the last couple of years. And so some of the jobs that were available like aren't. So I think um, I, I selfishly, I work for a company degree that focuses on learning and upskilling. And so we're always talking about how do we make sure that people have transferable skills. And Kathy and I talk about this in the book as well, um, but really kind of looking at the, your skill sets as a whole and helping to translate that and, and make sure that it fits within the, where there is energy and opportunity. That's awesome. And that's also how we can get away from the the, you know, the idea that the job posting says three years experience, but I only have X number of years in this position. And, and people get really down on themselves versus looking at like these transferable skills and the value it brings company and one of the th companies. And I think one of the main things I'm trying to help people understand is like, or at least start thinking about it, is like, what is the ROI of your role? Why is there even a budget for this position in the first place, right? And if you can think through that, like even developers, I'll, I'll ask a, a, a front-end developer, you know, what is the ROI of your role as a, as a web engineer? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, really, you have no idea what building a website for a business does for the bottom line? Like, that's, that's an obvious one that we can actually dig into together. And that's something that we do. And I think, it's interesting to look at these transferable skills and roll them into the narrative because that again gets us away from this idea of self-worth through our career and more so um, in the value that our skills and job bring to companies. Um, I often say like separate your salary from your self-worth, but I would even based on our conversation today say try and separate your job title from your self-worth. Try and separate a lot of these things. Put a little bit of distance between you and the position so that if you lose that position, you don't lose yourself, right? And I think this also plays into the narrative that we tell ourselves about our life, about our career. And that narrative will shape how we show up in networking conversations, how we show up in interviews and, and so on. So I'm curious, you know, in your book, you talk about nonviolent communications. And um, I'm curious, do you how, how do you sort of look at, do you look at that externally and how you talk to other people internally and how you talk to yourself? What's your sort of approach to that? I love that question um, because in nonviolent communication, which if folks who are listening haven't heard of, it's such a powerful modality developed by Marshall Rosenberg. It's used for interpersonal um, you know, conflict as well as conflict around the world. And it really is both, right? So it's about how you interact with yourself, connect to yourself and how you connect with others. And the specific angle that we really focus on the book is connecting with your feelings and unpacking what needs are in kind of at the root of those feelings and what beliefs that are shaping you kind of your worldview on what you want to do and how you want to do it in the work world. So it's it's very much about kind of tapping into your body. We're all sort of walking heads. Here we are, <laughs> we're heads today too. But, you know, really getting into your body, taking a breath, feeling your feet on the ground. Like, what are you feeling? Are you feeling? It's easy not to feel. Um, and then, really working to accept and name those feelings 
unpack the beliefs and needs and then say like, oh, okay, so then what strategies do I need to meet those needs? And one strategy might be we call networking community building because we're trying to move it from a transactional process that can feel yucky to use a non-technical term for folks um, to more of a um, relational, heartful, humane process. But, oh, maybe my friend, you know, Jane is someone that would be great to chat with. I want to check in with her and see how her first vacation in two years went to Portugal and learn about, you know, how her job is going and see if she knows anyone at X sort of company. So it becomes very relational and very much connected to tapping in using some of the tools from nonviolent communication to what you feel, what you need, what you want to do. Yeah, and I would add that it, we have a chapter also on, it's our last chapter. The other chapters are packed full of like practical tips and the last chapter is about how this translates to your job, right, in your everyday work. And I think the feelings and needs piece is really um, important in the context of relationships at work and having language to even negotiate around, um, you know, what, what's actually underneath an issue or a dynamic and giving language to it so that you can have a better conversation and you can create a path forward together. And I love that you're talking about building that language because I do think that the, it's, it is it is an emotional language barrier, right? I, I've definitely seen studies in the past where they talk about how when they ask people how they're feeling on a, you know, in surveys and things, people, there's really a limit to the number of words that people use. It's like happy, sad, angry. Like there's like not very much depth or nuance in the ways that people describe their emotions. When in reality, you might not be angry, you might be frustrated. Or when in reality, you might not be sad, you might just be let down, right? Or, you know, the, the more language we can put around these different feelings, the more we can, the more solutions we can come up with or, or responses we can come up with on how to um, navigate these emotions as they arise, right? If, if my only reaction to everything is anger, it's gonna be a pretty rough job search, right? But if I can break that down into a variety of responses and go, well, okay, maybe a walk because I'm feeling down or maybe I need to talk to someone because I'm feeling isolated or maybe you know whatever the thing might be. And I think that that'll help kind of give us more options when it comes to dealing with these kind of common issues, these common pitfalls that arise throughout the search. And, and I do appreciate that you talk about the common or the, um, how did you phrase it? I had it written down here, but you, you talked about this sort of um, the typical ups and downs that people have. And I think it's so interesting that you talk about it in this sort of common way that we're all going through it because from my experience being a coach, everyone thinks that their situation is so unique my job search is so unique. People aren't getting back to me. People aren't responding to me. The interviews aren't working for me. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The interviews aren't working for lots of people. All right. And I'm curious uh, in the way that you view all this stuff, what are those sort of common experiences that if we knew that they were more common than they were, we wouldn't necessarily blow them up into such big issues. Wow, there's so many, some you've already named like imposter syndrome. Another one that people come to me with is thinking that everyone knows how to do a job search. Like, why can't I figure it out? I mean, I want to coach, but I feel weird about it because I should have known how to do this. But of course, we're not taught how to do this at all. And we're certainly not given that language around emotion, let alone even how to strategize a search. We're also not taught and people really worry about like, how do you organize your time around the search? Like one of the things that Lauren and I talked about a lot in writing the book is that most people think they should be spending like 40 hours a week on a search. And if they're not, then they're a failure and they don't you know, get ice cream or whatever it is. And the reality is actually 
it's really less than that. I mean, it's less than half. Typically when people spend even 20 hours, always exception to every rule, but more like 10 to 15 is the sweet spot. Once you get much past that, you kind of can drive yourself nuts because it's kind of like going to the gym for 40 hours of the week, like not unless you're training for the Olympics. And so it's all the pieces of it, like the not hearing back, the, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to know how to write a cover letter. I'm supposed to know like what jobs I, you know, should apply to. I think the whole kit and caboodle is so alienating because for some reason as a culture, I don't know why this is, I'm so curious if anyone understands this, but like we don't really walk people through the basics of how to live a good life in any way, let alone getting a job. And so then when it comes to the job, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know, but I don't want to admit it. And many people come to coaching, tell me they've never told anyone some of the things they're telling me. I'm sure you you experienced that oh, as yeah. well. Oh yeah. And Lauren, do you have anything to add there? I'll just add that. I think a lot of people think I'll go online, I'll Google, how to do a resume or how to do a cover letter. And you have some very traditional or old fashioned ways of thinking about doing things. And so, you know, if, if people think that they do know how to do it, if, if they do know, if they do think they know how to do it, they're going online and getting advice. And so I think just for job seekers, like being really discerning and, and being open-minded about what's even possible in terms of how you present yourself and how you share your, share your unique value is really important because everybody's looking at the same generic, uh, you know, cover letter template online, or they're using, you know, beautiful graphic designs that may be over designing it. So finding that sweet spot where, you know, you feel like, okay, I, I've been able to communicate what I think is my value. And, and I, I hope this resonates with the person on the other end. Yeah, absolutely. I've definitely been at the over design side of things, <laughs> um, probably to the way, way too much of a degree because I took a, a design minor and thought I was Picasso. But uh, there's there's these, I, I like what you're hitting on here because it really is about sort of stripping things away and kind of looking at the reality of things. And I think maybe one of the reasons why we approach it in these um, non-ideal ways, let's say, is because most of the motivation that we're given in life, most of the sources of motivation that we've grown up with are um, deadline-based, fear-based, anxiety-based, right? Like, why do you study to get an A? Not because you enjoy the process of studying, right? Why do you go to college? Well, because you're scared if you don't, you won't get a job. Not because you actually want to learn these topics, right? And I think that that kind of just continues throughout life into these job search things and, and into these different things that we go through versus what you've been talking about this whole time is approaching things from a sense of curiosity, from a sense of service, from a sense of connection, um, and finding what I like to think of as like cleaner sources of motivation, right? There's these like dirty diesel sources of motivation that are based on like grit and willpower and forcing yourself to do things that you don't like, like I'm going to eat the broccoli even though I hate it, versus like, wait, I, I mean, maybe I don't have to eat the broccoli. Maybe there's something that's like less healthy, technically, but I'll actually do it. It's sort of going back to that workout metaphor of like, you don't want to be at the gym for 40 hours a week. That would be terrible. Um, and I think, you know, I always hear that phrase, like the best workout isn't the one that is technically the best. It's the one that you'll keep doing every single day. Right. And I think the same thing goes for the job search. There is the phrase, um, the, uh, if you're trying to find a job, finding a job is your full-time job. And every time I hear someone say that, I just go, oh gosh, no, <laughs> oh, we're going to have a hard time here because you are probably stressed out of your mind right now. So what are some of those maybe cleaner sources of motivation that you've seen people get to where they're actually feeling energized by the things that are motivating them rather than worn down by the things that they're using these like anxiety sources of motivation? What have you seen out there? Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking on some level about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And I think, you know, a lot of it is really taking a little bit of quiet time. It's a terrible cliche, but we do talk about it quite a bit in the book, not just in morning and evening rituals, but just as sort of a mindset 
to get present. It's very hard to even find your spark when you're in the midst of like checking Instagram and then checking the New York Times and then responding to a client email. So I think slowing down and sort of seeing, you know, what gives you a little bit of energy, it really can be anything from, you know, sipping your favorite tea to, I know Lauren loves to swim, like taking a swim, reading an inspirational line, taking, I have someone I work with who does like collaging, like on a break at work, like she's got like a little workstation and she sets it up and it just gives her energy. I think it's very unique to each of us, but it's about finding what are those things that we can access that make us feel just really connected and whole without having to go into the performance and all the rigmarole, you know? Yeah, I think about it in terms of childlike wonder, right? And just getting back to some of the basic things that maybe we enjoyed and we have enjoyed since we were young. And maybe those are still part of our life. Like for me, swimming, you know, clearly, Kathy, and, um, you know, like playing outside or taking a walk. And so I do think it's really fun if you can get into that mindset. That makes everything less painful. And I think creates a space where you can start to enjoy the process of meeting people, of connecting with people, building relationships, discovering new ideas and opportunities and researching what's out there, discovering trends and things you never even knew. Um, and all to say that at the end of the day that that helps inform you as a person and also your, your work identity. Love it. And we'll just wrap up with one quick rapid fire question. But if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about the job search process in its entirety, what would each of you change? I always wanted to bring everybody to a party to interview and just like have a conversation and then be done with it. <laughs> so I, I, I wish the job search were, were more social. Um, whether that's how it would manifest, it might be that like we as, as job seekers might come together and be allies for each other or on the employer side, like there's a more connected environment where people feel like, oh, I've actually met all these great people. And uh, even if I'm not going to work with them, I had a really positive experience. I love that, Lauren. <laughs> I didn't know you thought that. That's amazing. Um, it's interesting. Mine is kind of related. I have such a dream that the process allow for potential candidates to come in and actually be paid for a few days a week, separate from other candidates to really see what it's like to work. I mean, it's kind of like dating. It's not like you get married usually after three dates unless they're each three months long, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so like really allowing for people to get to know each other because there's no, you know, kind of shortening the process of relationship building and knowing each other, even with all the technology we have. So I think the whole recruitment process is just very retro. And I hope we move towards, actually, I like the combo of what we're both suggesting, Laura, that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah, it is. It, it almost seems like if we could just get to that more modern place, it'd be so great. Um, and I will uh, push your book real quick. Everyone should go check out the Empowered Job Search, um, filled with a lot of great advice and exercises for your job search. And then I'll let each of you give us a bit of a shout on how people can find you and engage with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis. Well, we're both on LinkedIn. You can find us there. And the empoweredjobsearch.com has more information on how to get our book. That's all for me the same. And also Kathy Wasserman with the C.com is my own website. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think these points are invaluable for people. And I, I just hope everyone who's listening is just gonna take a moment to get to know themselves a little bit better. Kathy, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this episode today. I really appreciate your support of what we're building here at Career Therapy as we continue to try and 
explore the hidden side of modern work and tell some of the stories that maybe don't get enough light shed on them. If you enjoyed what you listened to today, I hope you will leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, Subscribe to this wherever you're listening or watching on YouTube, Spotify, etc. And uh, share this with some friends who you know are going through similar experiences and looking to build their career and, and gain some insights along the way. Again, thank you so much for stopping by, and I wish you the best. I'll see you on the next episode.